but now that I'm with him, um, the way he yeah, handles people and um, our group and his family, it's uh, it, it's inspiring and um, I'm very grateful that he's around and, and helping me in my journey. This is Sports Spectrum, bringing Jesus into the sports conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey, Skip Schumacher. Welcome to Sports Spectrum. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's good to connect with you. The season, the regular season ending is is close here, and I thought it'd be good to start kind of with this year and reflect a little bit. You know, we're not there yet. We're almost there into the postseason. Forget the wins and losses for a second. Uh, obviously, the Cardinals have had some really great stretches this season, especially after the All-Star break and particularly in August. But what has this year been like for you coming back as a bench coach, returning to the team that you were drafted by and and played for for so many years? I can't really believe that I'm here. Um, you know, drafted here in 2001, being around my best friends um, once again, and Adam Wainwright, I don't know how he's still playing, but he's still here and not only still playing, but like still really good. Um, yeah. There's former coaches uh, that I had that are on the staff. Pop Warner was my coach and uh, Brian Eversgird was my coach in instructional league. Uh, just pretty cool how the Cardinals promote from within, right? There's so many players that they drafted on the field right now. There's so many coaches that came through the minor leagues that are on the staff right now. The culture is second to none and just so, so lucky and blessed to for this thing to come full circle and, you know, be teammates and now coach with Adam Wainwright and Yadi Molina and Albert Pujols. It's, it's kind of surreal. I was going to say that has to be weird. Maybe the first time, maybe not now, but back in like March or February when you guys are first coming together and you realize you're coaching three guys who are certainly legends, but guys that were teammates of yours and you won a championship with, you know, over a decade ago, that has to be, you know, that had to be a little weird, I would imagine. Yeah. First day in, I made him run a lap. You know, just to show, you know, that I'm a coach, you're the player, you know, I had a little respect yeah. around here. No, um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, when you're around good people um, and, you know, they, they knew what kind of teammate I was, I know what kind of teammate they are and they know how much I care. And um, and I think there's just this mutual respect, you know, within, the, you know, those type of players that are, you know, I, everyone wants to say a couple of them are on their way out. But some people are telling Wainwright that he's on his way out, even though like he's could play two or three more years if he wanted to. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it was a weird feeling in the off season, but, you know, after reconnecting with them and, you know, coming inside the clubhouse at the end of the day, you know, we're friends and teammates first and nothing has changed. Yeah. Wayno, we featured him and Jenny on, in our magazine, uh, had him on the podcast back before the season started. And we asked him like, when are you going to know when it's time? And he said, it's going to always come down to my family and my kids. And obviously, sometimes, you know, nature takes its course and you get old and, and, and sort of the, the game retires you because you're not performing the way you did previously. But he's still really good. And as long as he's still good, there's going to be people interested, particularly St. Louis. But he said it comes down to his family. And I just thought that was such a great way to do it. And obviously his faith as well and trusting the Lord to direct him. But I just thought that was so great because in 2018, 2019, he was thinking the same thing that he's thinking right now. It's just fascinating to watch. Yeah. You know, in, in those years, 2018, what you were talking, I was a um, coach in San Diego with the Padres and it didn't look good. And that's when he had, you had a broken arm. He didn't know it. And you're trying to pitch through some pain and it, it looked like it was the end. And usually baseball tells you when it's time to retire, right? You don't get to tell baseball. He's one of the chosen ones that. You know, he gets to decide when he wants to leave and if he wants to continue. Um, that doesn't happen for everybody. Obviously, baseball told me right away that you are, that's it. You're, that's enough. I don't want to see you anymore. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, you're right. He has a, you know, big family um, and he does amazing things in the community and in the clubhouse. And the value that he brings in that clubhouse is second to none. So not only would you lose a frontline starter, but you would lose the leader of that clubhouse. And, you know, that was the case when I was a player and that hasn't changed now that I'm a coach. So I want to do a quick word association with the three legends that you talked about, Yachty, Pujols, and Wayno, and just have you describe them in a word or a phrase or a sentence 
Uh, and then I definitely want to dive into your story and your faith, but maybe just let's start with Wayno since we've been talking about him. What is a word or phrase that you can use to describe him? Well, um, it's tough for me um, to give uh, a, a, just one word to associate what Wayno means to me on a personal level because um, he was the first one to give me my Bible. I, like I have one Bible. And he's the one that gave it to me in 2005. Um, and that was my first one I ever had. So there's more. He's he's he has taught me so much in life and baseball and family and faith. I, it's tough for me just to say one word to describe what he means to me. I know my fans will you know say different things and friends will say different things to him. But um, man. Um, for me, like the most faithful person I've ever been around. Um, and I, and I, I don't use that word lightly. Yeah. Faithful is a good word. Um, how about Yachty? I mean, just, I, I just say the name and I think about, I remember 2006, you know, and watching him hit that home run to lead the Cardinals over the Mets in the ninth inning. And that's 2006. That's 16 years yeah. ago. And he's a catcher. And he's still catching pretty much every day. How about Yachty? Uh, I, I would say resilient. I, I, don't, I don't understand how he still does this, right? Like 17 years of playing the game in the same organization, catching. That makes no sense on how you can still catch right. um, and catch at an elite level um, and still block the way he does and still throw the way he does and um, and he still puts together, you know, a very competitive at bat. And if you're on the other side, you don't want to see Yachty at the plate with runners in scoring position. Like, I don't care what age he is. You don't want to see that happen in a big spot of the game. Um, but the, the catching side of it, he went away. He was injured for a couple weeks or a couple months, actually, this year with his knees. Yeah. And since he since he came back, we went on a 20 and three run. Before that, when he was on the DL, we were 17 and 20, just to show you the impact he has. And by the way, he hasn't set the world on fire at the plate. It was just to show you what he means, his presence in the lineup, but um, how he navigates a game through, you know, with our pitching staff is, you know, I've never seen it before and I don't think I'll ever see it again. So that's two ageless wonders. And then you have <laughs> a guy coming back who was your teammate for many years, Albert Pujols, who has said he's retiring. And the man is close to 700 homers and winning player of the week honors and doing crazy things at this stage of his career. He started in 2001. Uh, I mean, geez, that's the year you were drafted. That's the year I don't even want to tell people where I was in 2001. That's the year I got saved 21 years ago. So think about Albert Pools for a minute and being able to coach him and, and something that comes to mind when you when you're asked about him. I mean, he's the goat. I mean, that's that's just. The, I mean, I'm not going to even sugarcoat that one. To me, he's the best player in our generation. He's the best right-handed hitter that ever played the game. And again, I don't use that word lightly either. Um, but what he does, uh, I don't. It, it doesn't make any sense to me of how he's doing this. Um, I am the same age as him. I feel terrible, <laughs> and he's hitting home runs yeah. uh, in the major leagues against young kids that nowadays are throwing every pitch is 95 to a hundred. Um, and he's catching up to it. Like it's no big deal. And he's the best hitter in the major league against left-handed pitching. To, so he can continue. Not only is he surviving as people are like, Oh man, how's this going to work? And, you know, if Albert doesn't play well, you know, what's going to happen to St. Louis or, you know, if they're going to be in a tough situation, we can't get him out of the lineup. I mean, that's that's where it's gone to. Right. And we're not in the position we're in in the second half without Albert. He's just like, you know, had this resurgence at the all star break. And, um, you know, the home run derby was really cool moment for him and all the fans and the players and giving him the respect that he deserves. And you see this just like smile on his face when he comes to the field every day. He's so impactful. He's the one leading the hitters meetings. And these young kids, I'm looking around, I'm like, you understand what you have in these hitters meetings. You have, not only have Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt and those guys speaking up, but then you have this legend sitting next to Albert, or sitting next to Yachty, leading these hitters meetings. I'm like, 
you're the luckiest human being is alive. And I think when you're in it, when I was in it as a player, you you realize he's really good, right? He's winning MVPs and doing, you know, on this at the time was this 10 year run of 330 home runs and 100 RBIs every year. Yeah. And then he went to Anaheim and people kind of lost on it kind of got it kind of got lost on who this guy really was as a player. But to come back and to show like, I mean, Goldie hit th- his 300th home run. He's like, dude, I'm 400 away from him, <laughs> you know, just to put that in perspective. And Goldie is also a Hall of Fame player. So um, just to watch him every day go about his work. He's relentless in his work, still at 42 years old. And for the young guys to see this this organization is in a really good spot will be sustainable for a lot a long time because of adam yadi and albert going about you know how they do it and these young guys getting to watch it every day yeah it's going to be fun watching uh, the postseason and seeing how far i mean you got such a loaded national league it's going to be a lot of fun watching the postseason and see who comes out uh, and plays and represents them in the World Series. Skip Schumacher is our guest. He's bench coach with the St. Louis Cardinals and a former Cardinals player. You mentioned the Bible that Wayno gave you in 2005. And I thought that'd be a great place to kind of pivot this conversation into the side of faith. Tell us your faith journey, your faith story. And it sounds like that 2005 moment with Wayno was a pretty big deal for you. Take us through that. Well, you mentioned the story, and I do think, you know, um, I have a Bible study back home, and we did a different Bible study this year on the Tony Dungy book, The Uncommon Life. And instead of just you know, diving into the Bible, you know, and doing every book, we wanted to kind of switch gears and do it on, um, you know, holding each other accountable on a daily reading. And the Tony Dungy book really yeah. helped us. So in one of the Bible or Bible study meetings, um, we had him every Thursday night and, um, my buddy, Chad Marlowe said, you know, it's really powerful if you write down your story. And I never thought about it like that. Plus I didn't know my, but these are my best friends in life that I'm doing life with and asking questions about parenthood and, you know, navigating a marriage and all that stuff. And he's like, write down your story. Let's everybody write down their story. And you start writing your story down. You're trying to, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, this guy was in my life at this time for this reason. And, and you don't realize what you went through to get to your spot. You are right now and how God was in your life earlier on before I got my Bible um, in 2005 from Adam Wainwright. And my journey kind of started in 2001. Um, I was in uh, a transfer from Loyola Marymount to UCSB uh, baseball, got injured. And um, because of that injury, um, I was out for the the whole year uh, in 2000, sorry, 2000, shoulder injury and surgery. So it was the first year that I didn't have baseball every single day of my life. And I got to sit and watch. Well, I had an assistant uh, coach at the time um, named John Kirkard who invited me to a Bible study Sunday mornings before games. And it was like one or two players. It wasn't that many players. And um, typically I had such a regimented routine that, I didn't have time for the for the 10 minute chapel, right? Like there's not enough time in the day for me to just sit down and get into the word. And I didn't really know it, didn't grow up in it, didn't make any sense to me to do it. Now I got a D1 scholarship. You know, my life is good. Um, but I had time, right? And so that injury now placed me into a 10 minute chapel before each game. And and when I'm writing my story down, I'm like, oh my gosh, you didn't think of that. Like I was so consumed in me about my shoulder and this is going to ruin my career and what's the draft. And, and what happened was, is I now am in a 10 minute chapel diving into a word that I never even thought about in my whole life. And it's crazy how this thing happened. Right. Like, so that kind of started my journey. It was a 10 minute chapel, didn't go to church, but it started, you know, my wheel started spinning. So I get drafted in 2001. I continue with the chapel, I'm trying to make this story short, you know, but as I'm writing it, it's lengthy. So um, 2001, I start doing the chapels, you know, every Sunday morning before the the games. And then um, Adam Wainer gets traded from the Braves to the Cardinals. We are in uh, AAA. My wife is now with me. Jenny is now with Adam. Um, and we, my wife is my girlfriend at the time. And we are in Memphis. 
And Adam's like, hey, we should uh, we should go out to dinner, you know, meet the wives and, you know, uh, the wives should meet each other and, you know, be a good icebreaker. And it's like, yeah, that's great. This first week in Memphis. So he, <laughs> he knocks on the door. And I'm like, we're going to like Chili's or something like, you know, you can wear a Lulu shirt, at, you know, whatever, and not a big T-shirt, whatever you want to wear. And they come over. He is in a full tux. And she is in like this prom dress, like winter formal, like high school dress, all decked out makeup. He's like, you know, and Lindsay and I look, she has never met Jenny. And I'm in like shorts and a t-shirt. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, what in the world? But he, that was the icebreaker, right? And we just started, you know, dying laughing. Like, what are you guys doing? It was so funny. We went out to dinner looking like that. <laughs> um, and you know, they ended up being the best friends, uh, you know, in our, in my baseball career and my, my kids grew up around their kids, but that started the journey, um, of our friendship. And then instead of just going to that chapel now, every Sunday, I was just going in Nate, you know, kind of naked. I didn't have a Bible that I brought to chapel and he gave me my bi a Bible to bring to chapel. And in it, he wrote everything you need to know for the rest of your life will be in this book, Adam Wainwright. And I still have it. I haven't bought another Bible. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, but I have, uh, that's the only one I have. And, um, and that kind of started my dive into the Bible, um, in 2005. Wow. That is a fantastic story. Um, I've not heard that story before and I've talked to Wayno quite a few times and he, sh I think other people have similar stories. Chris Carpenter had a story that he shared about Wayno and I think Matt, Matt Holiday and the impact they had. Take me through that progression of being a Cardinals player. Obviously, you're a guy who's competing. You want to make the team, and you do. You get to make your debut in 2005 that year um, against Boston. And then you go on this run, and you get to spend the next seven years or so with this team and with a core group of players who love Jesus. Not all of them, obviously, and everybody's different in, in different walks and different stages of whatever their faith journey might be. But there was a real core group of people, particularly in that 2011 year when you won the World Series, who were walking with Christ. Tell me about the progression of your baseball career and sort of the parallel of the progression of your faith journey. Yeah. So it, this is a unique organization, right? They don't, it's not like they're pushing this at all. You know, that's not what the St. Louis Cardinals are. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm getting chills about it, you know, thinking about it because of the guys that, you know, they signed the Cardinals have been so good at just signing really good people, good players, amazing players, but really good people. And if I don't have Matt holiday and Lance Berkman, and I, I, I mean, I just, again, getting chills thinking about it. Um, I don't know where I am in my journey and you need to be held accountable, you know, in this game and in life and have people surrounding you and, you know, keeping you on this, you know, on this, on this path, because you can, you can veer off your, it's a lot of, a lot of lonely nights in the hotels and really nice hotels and really nice cities. And, um, and having that group around me, um, I needed it early on in a marriage and early on in fatherhood. And I needed it really, really bad. And more than I realized now thinking back on it, you know, 15 years later, um, how, it, you know, how impactful they were. And, you know, so I was at the very beginning of my journey in my walk in 2005, right? I mean, I'm just got my Bible and, and, and uh, now I'm on the road with, um, with Adam and they're starting to have Bible studies in the room. And um, so it's taken, you know, and it's never, it was never thrown, you know, th you have to go here. You have to go to this Bible study. You have to go to chapel. And um, it, it was more of like, I mean, I really want to, and this is interesting to me and I have questions and, you know, they still have questions, right. Which is cool. You know, it's not like Adam and Lance knew everything, Like they asked each other, Hey, what do you got on that? You know, what do you think about that? Um, and Matt, and so it's, what's neat is they were constantly growing also because of the, the rookie asking questions um, in the same group. So, yeah, I, you know, we would have 15, sometimes 16 guys in that chapel, uh, Bibles. I mean, it was unbelievable, um, you know, and, and different guys talking and it, it obviously helped me and my growth. And, um, I wouldn't be hosting a Bible study every Thursday night at my house right now, uh, in the off season, if I didn't see what they were doing to me and how impactful it was for me. And I think what, um, maybe the most impactful part is, um, 
you know, someone told me, um, you know, who do you want your kids to learn from, uh, f- uh, learn about Jesus from? Do you want it from somebody else or do you want it from you? I'm like, oh man, uh, I mean, if they have questions, I, I, it should be me. You know, I don't want to tell them to go ask somebody else. Right. And uh, so when, when I heard that, um, you know, that really struck a chord and um, actually Goldie uh, said it to me or uh, in a Bible study the other day, it's like, you know, when you, you know, if your kids ask you a question, are you going to know the answer? So it help, makes me accountable. It may, help me accountable then. And, and um, help, uh, you know, makes me uh, accountable now. So taking it to today and to now in 2022, coaches and players are able to do Bible studies together. Is that how it, uh, the sort of setup is with the Cardinals this year? Yeah. Um, you know, Goldie kind of led the way on that, which I love. You know, we didn't have that uh, when I was a player. It was very separate, right? It was like coaches and then players. And then, you know, they they would come to the chapel, but they wouldn't be a part of the Bible studies and that kind of thing. But the um, the cool thing is, you know, we have a guy named Turner Ward. That's our um, assistant hitting coach. And he has been phenomenal um, for me and my growth and for the players. And, um, you know, the players, um, uh, you know, they don't know. They don't care about how much, you know, until, you know, they know how much you care. Right. And he he's he said that earlier on. And, and I mean, this guy, the care factor is like way up here and the players just love him. And um and anyway, to your, back to your question, Goldie has this, uh, you know, not makes, but asks that there's a volunteer uh, to go through a book um, each month. So, and it's through a um, um, a text message and Nolan Arenado, what do you got on, you know, you know, this, this book and what do you got on, you know, what do you think about this first? And so we're getting pinged, you know, pretty much you know, all day um, about like, Hey, what do you think about this first and commentary and not only are the coaches, um, you know, diving, you know, chiming in, but the players and the, the guys that are just now beginning in their faith are chiming in and um, you know, what Goldie's done with, you know, Wayno obviously and, and leading that text message group. And that text thread has been really good for me this year as a coach. That says a lot when you're talking about, a guy who basically is leading, you know, he's the best player on your team and having an amazing year as far as what he's been able to do in Paul Goldschmidt. And yeah, he's leading the way, you know, spiritually as well. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, there's, it's bigger than him. Right. And it's never been about me. He doesn't want to talk about himself ever. If you look at the ever. media, he's just like not talking about me. It's not, it's not about me. Um, you know, the way he goes about life, is more impressive to me than his MVP season. And that should say a lot about who this guy is. And, um, you know, you always respected him from afar in the other dugout. But now that I'm with him, um, the way he yeah, handles people and um, our group and his family, it's uh, it, it's inspiring and um, I'm very grateful that he's around and, and helping me in my journey. I do want to pivot and ask you about um, something I was reading uh, w- with regards to the number 55. And I didn't realize this until I did my research that you have a pretty cool story in regards to why you wear that number with a certain Cy Young pitcher uh, from the Dodgers back in the day, right? Can you share that story? Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a good and a bad. So okay. So here we go. <laughs> so I was a Dodger fan growing up, um, and grew up in Los Angeles, California, and um, Dodgers were really good. And so uh, we would go to the Dodger games and we, my dad and I went to a um, restaurant after, and it was uh, Tom Lasorda, Steve Sachs, Oral Hershiser. And they were, they were, yeah, pretty cool. Right. And at the time there's no cell phones or anything. So we were done um, eating and they were playing pinball and kind of like it had some odd sign autographs here and there, but like they, you know, you wanted them to be able to finish what they were doing and not bother them and, you know, kind of respect they have a life too. And um, probably trying to get away from the game a little bit. So, uh, so I went up to my dad, I was, you know, four or six years old, can't remember, but you know, my dad's all right, you can go ahead and, you know, ask him and went up with me. And um, so asked Oral if he could take a picture and sign a ball. And so he picked me up. Dad took a Polaroid um, of it. And I have a signed ball from Oral. Tom Lasorda, same thing, to a future Dodger, 2000, 
13. I ended up, I'll talk about that later, but I ended up being a Dodger, but I have that pole right in my baseball room, which is pretty cool to a future Dodger, Tommy Lasorda. Yeah. And then uh, Steve Sack said no. So, <laughs> wow. so yeah, um, you know, maybe you never know what a player is going through, right? right. Um, you know, so, that having, having been a player now, you know, it's not always, you know, expecting to be in your best mood, no matter what's going on. In exactly, life. exactly. So, Fast forward, I get, I'm in, in um, St. Louis, I get traded. Now I'm a Dodger childhood dream team. You know, I had an unbelievable run in St. Louis. Now I get to play in front of my, you know, family and friends. It's pretty surreal. And I get to now, and, and um, but I will say when I got to choose a number in, um, in St. Louis, um, there was not many op- there's literally like three options right because every number is retired there's so many greats in uh in no. st louis so there, there wasn't too many options for a utility player they did you know it's like what do you want kid and i'm like nobody's got 55 there's no way and i thought back of how you know gracious oral was and and uh, when i was a kid and i've always remembered that i had an oral baseball glove that I used until high school that had that, you know, that fake signature inside of it. And him and Ozzie Smith, those are the only two ones that I used because of the impact he had on me as a kid. And then I get traded orals. Now the play by play guy or with, you know, kind of like a radio guy. And um, I have a chance. To, I, I was shocked that the number wasn't retired. Right. I mean, I thought it would be retired for sure uh, in LA. So I ended up getting um, that number um in LA which is a crazy feeling to have and he throws out the first pitch I asked him to throw out the first pitch if I could if he if he throw out the first pitch could I catch it and so you know all that coming full circle was pretty neat but I will say about sacks is it helped me as a player like I still remember that right I'm 42 years old and so now if a kid asks I can't sign every kid's you know ball or whatever but it's tough for me to say no now, right? Because I have that memory and I don't want them to think about what I think about him in a very probably, you know, tough moment in his life. And who knows what's going on again, but, um, but yeah, it still resonates <laughs> about and Now I'm 42 have, years old. Have you ever met or run into him like in your adulthood of playing and just all the years that you played in the majors? Have you run into Steve Saxon ever yeah. talked in that story? Yeah, I have. Uh, <laughs> he was a first base coach actually in Arizona. And I was a Dodger. And uh, so I did mention it to him. He said, you know, that he would never have done that. He doesn't remember it. And, you know, and, you know, again, like there, he, I can't have, millions of kids have probably asked him as a player and a coach for an autograph. And again, you can't sign every single one of them. So there's no hard feelings, but I did. Uh, yeah, I absolutely told him like, hey, man, you uh, you said no to me when I was a four year old. Come on, you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> See, but that's so interesting because I remember my childhood hero was Daryl Strawberry as a kid. And when I worked at ESPN, I got to spend a whole day with him and bring him around and, and produce a day of shows with him at ESPN. This was 2009. And I was worried and nervous that I was meeting my hero and he comes and he's just the most joyful, wonderful person. Like he's such a good guy and, uh, and still is to this day, but he signed a bunch of baseballs that day and you're not supposed to sign on It's not for me. He was signing them for a bunch of different, you know, ESPN employees. And that's kind of a no, no, like Daryl is there to, you know, promote his book and we're not there to just take pictures and get autographs from these, these people were there to do a job that day. And I remember asking him, I'm like, does that bother you that everywhere you go, he's a pretty recognizable face too you have to sign autograph. Does that bother you? Everybody's coming. He's like, Jason, I never know if one person coming up to me is going through something bad. And if I treat them like crap, that's going to stick with them forever. And that's why the Steve Sachs story. And again, this is not bashing Steve Sachs at all, Oh yeah, yeah. but it just reminds me of the fact that you never know what other people are going through as well to where you just saying yes, or how you doing, or even making them feel special for 20 seconds might change their life. And Daryl said, that's why I do this. I never say no, unless obviously eating with family or something else comes up. But he's like, I never say no, because I never know what those people are going through. And I want them to have a a memorable experience in meeting me. I just thought that was so powerful. And you've been around the game and some of the greatest players to ever play the game are teammates of yours or former teammates or current teammates. It's got to be fascinating to kind of watch how each person handles that. I would imagine most of them handle it in a similar way where they don't want to be jerks. They know they can't sign everybody's, you know, ball or take pictures with everybody. 
but they want to have integrity, if you will, to make sure they're treating people properly. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard because you get the other the other side of it is you get you know grown men who are just like following you to breakfast, right? And um, and so it ruins it for these kids and you know the 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 people that really would it would be super impactful for them on that day, whether yeah. it be at the game or outside the hotel or whatever it is. And so it it's it stinks that it went the other direction because you have literally grown men pushing kids away to get their ball signed so they can sell it when we were kids it was like i mean i still have that polaroid picture signed right it was never going to be sold on ebay um and it's it's impacted my life and i wear 55 today because of it um and so i think uh it is exactly what you said there's there's times where you you know really love giving back into the kids at, every time actually it's the other side of it that that ruins that whole that whole deal yeah, and that's the side that you really gotta kind of manage in the best way possible. There's really no, there's no wrong or right answer in the sense that, but the kids are there's something different about kids, and yeah. uh, that'll always stick with me as well. Even with my daughter, you know, when I take her to a game, and her favorite team is the Mets, and she'll say, "Dad, can can I? What what's the chances I could meet Pete Alonso?" I'm like, "I I got no connection here, Sarah. Let's go down close and see if that can happen." And yeah. um, so now she's a teenager and she's in she's in college, and it's different, but. Just seeing it through the eyes of children, I think, is it, it humbles you and reminds you of the the true spirit of what sports is is about. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. As we yeah. close, and I know you've been so generous with your time, so thank you, especially in the midst of a yeah. season still going on. What's the great lesson that God has taught you this year? When you look back to this season and you see where the Lord has brought you, you you even said it in the very beginning of this conversation how wonderfully blessed you feel just to be back with this team and the team that and the people that are on this team and the, and the coaches and the players, what's the thing that God has been teaching you and showing you when you think back to this year and what you've been through? Yeah. So this is the first year I have been away from my family during a season. Every year, my kids and my wife have been with me. My son is now a freshman in high school. Uh, my daughter's a seventh grader. I'm not going to uproot them, take them to St. Louis in the middle of summer and then take them away from their first high, you know, high school experience and, and then go back in and, you know, that the whole change, I, I wasn't going to do it, but my wife and I prayed about it uh, when I was offered this job and we said, let's see if we can do it. What I've learned is bloom where you're pro bloom, where you're planted. So um, I think, you know, God has put me in different spots in my life. He's put me here for a reason. So instead of, thinking about, oh man, I really miss my family, which I do. I miss them terribly, but I'm able now to impact people like Adam and Matt and Lance and other guys have impacted me while they were here away from their family. So I have a chance to impact others. And it's not about me. I can tell you that I've learned that uh, throughout my career, but watching Goldie go about his MVP season, but um, everything I know right now in my life has been either taught to me or I've learned, right? I haven't made up anything. So I have a chance to give back. And my buddy in that Bible study that I have with the uncommon life is like, Skip, when you go somewhere on the road and you're away from your family, bloom where you're planted. And that really hit me. I'm like, you're right. And instead of being like a miserable person because I miss some games back at home or I'm missing some some really solid talks with my daughter after school or whatever it is. And those are tough. I have to bloom where I'm planted here. And uh, so I think um, that has been a big lesson for me. And um, not only can I help, you know, people in their faith and their journey, um, but, you know, obviously in the, in the dugout with coaches and, and, uh, and players. It's funny you say that because I spent a day with Tony Dungy as well, and it changed my life. And part of what he said and what the people around him said that day was for me. And I'm quoting this, Skip. This is not a joke here. They said, bloom where you're planted, Jason, at ESPN. Not a joke. So I actually got shirts made about it. I wrote it in my second book. I mean, it's just – that that's is crazy. that is <laughs> what – that's the Lord working, first of all. But that is, yeah. I think, a wonderful piece of advice that we can always remind ourselves of wherever we are in life is God has us here for a purpose on purpose to bloom where, where we're planted and affect others. So 
It just makes me wow. smile when I hear what you said there, my friend. Thanks for okay. thanks so much for being here. Uh, best wishes for the rest of this season, and we'll watch you guys in the postseason, hopefully, and, and, and it'll be special. I think it could be a pretty cool year if you're a Cardinals fan. So thanks for being here, and all the best to you. Yeah, I love what you do, and this is uh, it's an honor to be on your podcast. So thanks for having me. Thanks so much for watching today on Sports Spectrum. Make sure you click that subscribe button so you don't miss any other videos. And if you want more stories on sports and faith, check out our website, sportsspectrum.com. Okay, take two.